Well, hello and welcome to Crucial Conversations, episode 50. Is this going to be an extravaganza? Is there confetti? I oh, I forgot the confetti. Okay, it's just going to be episode 50. No extravaganza involved because I forgot the confetti. Peter. Sorry. But hey, there might be a lot of new listeners, viewers, because things are like happening and whatnot. If you are just discovering us, especially if you're on YouTube, this is actually a, a podcast <laughs> that I upload to YouTube. <laughs> Hence the static image. Right. So if you want to get the podcast, which actually releases before the YouTube version of this, just open up your favorite podcast app and search for Crucial Productions and you'll get the podcast right there. Subscribe to it. You get Crucial Conversations. And Kevin, what else do they get? Because you do cool stuff Sunday mornings talking about... Well, I teach Bible study on Sunday mornings, and we record that and put it up as a podcast. So you get a Bible study right now in the Gospel of John. Um, yeah. You also get to hear from the the saints assembled at Our Savior Lutheran Church and in their that questions same Bible study. and that yeah. kind of stuff. So it's, it literally is my Bible class on Sunday morning recorded. So you get yeah. their questions and my answers and sometimes my sad attempt at humor and <laughs> those kinds of things. But yeah, it's it's a Bible study. And what we do is we open the Bible and we read it and we talk about what the verses mean. And we've put those both in our Crucial Productions feed because that's what, what we do. What we do, yeah. So we've been doing this series on Christology, Kevin. Yep. And if you guys are just joining us, I think we've done six episodes on it, maybe seven you can go back. We actually have a playlist on YouTube of just the Christology ones now, as well as a whole Crucial Conversations playlist. But we've been, we, we had, I don't know if we, you're like looking around for something, Kevin. I'm getting really distracted. Just keep talking. Just keep talking. Nobody else can see this. I, I know. That's the funny part. It's like nobody can see Kevin like looking around trying to find. Well, now they I can. I have no in idea mind's eye. what. Now ripping paper and just throwing things. throwing things. And no, put that down, Kevin. Come on, no. Come on, keep going. Podcast. Okay. <laughs> this is bad radio. Or it's really, really good radio. It's I'm bad. not sure. Trust me. Okay. Well, let us know in the comments if this is bad radio no, or good going. radio. Series on Christology. Because we're convinced that scripture is all about Christ. We're convinced of that because Christ says it's all about him. And we're doing this series not because, at least speaking for myself, I don't consider myself an expert on this whole thing. I, I'm doing it because I actually want to learn along with. And I've really enjoyed digging into Scripture with you, Kevin, and looking at all these different passages that talk about Jesus and his work and who he is and all that wonderful stuff. And so I wanted to spend a little bit of time this episode, especially for new listeners that are jumping in, just kind of talking through why why we do that, why we're looking at scripture in this way, what that means for us, and that kind of stuff. How was that for a nice rambling introduction? Well, I think I think it it, it um, opens the door for further rambling. Oh boy, your is, turn. Which is fun. And I don't I wasn't planning on saying this, but I'm I think I'm going to it sounds like I'm going we to We don't plan on saying half of what we right. say. But this is something I've been I've been working through lately and have talked to a couple of people about, and they seem to look at me quizzically, but then kind of go, hmm, at the end. So we'll see how that goes. So I think when I read the scriptures, this is kind of what I get. Well, let's let's back up before that. <laughs> when when we as humans, when we think about God, it the history of religions, the history of philosophy, the history of human thought has shown that humans are prone to think that there is something out there, whether that's um, a force that controls nature, like we would call her our mother, like Mother nature. Mother Earth, Mother so, Nature. Right. Yeah. So, so we are, we personify the thing that controls the weather, or that you know whatever. Um, so we say, oh, Mother Nature causes it to snow, or. Jack Frost, or you know, we, we mm -hmm. personify these things that control the the things in our lives that we can't control. So we even say, you know, obviously the easy one is acts of God for storms. That's all nature. But we also assign, even in the in the theory of evolution, um, we assign a personification to evolution, which is weird because it's a scientific theory. It can't yeah. actually have any 
will. But yeah, we'll as, say, as, as if evolution, evolution has, desires for it to be, you yeah. know, or, or intended or, right, or intended. purpose. And or, you go, no, it's just, evolution is just an observation. It can't have a person. And that's that's kind of the, the scientific secular view of things without actually organized religion. But the point is that humans seem to, the way we use vocabulary, the way we, we use metaphor, is we all seem to believe that there's something bigger out there controlling these things that we can't control. Even if we don't believe it's real, but it's, metaphorically there's something controlling mm-hmm. it. Um, holding, holding the stars up or, or holding the planets in the proper... I mean, all these words that we use, right? And, and as I was thinking this through and listening to a, a ton of philosophy... The history of philosophy is is literally marked with a discussion on God, right? Even if they're atheistic philosophers, <laughs> they're, they're they're obsessed with describing God, even if it's a non-existence of God. It's it's ex- obsessive in their language, in the, in the way they think, and and even the way we talk about language often reflects a view of divine or something. And so here's the issue: is if we, if we all know and believe that there's a divine something, and divine is a weird word, but whatever you want to call the, the not us, bigger than us, controls things bigger than us thing, reality, mm-hmm. essence, being, thing, whatever, <laughs> right? You have to come with some word for it. And so the common word for that is God. Well, that doesn't really help me as a person to understand how do I relate to that thing. Is that thing simply controlling nature and I just kind of get whatever results from that and they don't care? It doesn't care, whatever. Um, is it... Is there something I do that can influence... Right. Do I have some kind of influence in this yeah. giant power thing? Um, do they care about what I do? Mm-hmm. Do Do I have a moral obligation to live in a way that makes this whatever it is happy? Is there emotions in this thing? Right. If it has a will, if it controls things, does it also have some kind of there, perception of pleasure and displeasure? Or, or is there judgment? a purpose or is an it, intent a involved? Yeah. And 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 again, this isn't new. This has kind of been rehashed through the history of thought and theology and, and philosophy and and discussion, but even in anthropology and, mm-hmm. and all kinds of whatever field you want to ologize, it it's kind of there somehow. And what I see when I read the Bible is not only an acknowledgement of that reality, but a revelation of it. And as you read the scriptures, you get the notion that there are many gods. There, there's no doubt that there are many gods in this world. The Babylonians had their gods. The Assyrians had their gods. The Egyptians had their gods. Persians had the theirs. Persians had their the gods. The Philistines had theirs. The Greeks, the Romans. I mean, they're all there, yep. right? And then Did you had say all Egyptians the already? Egyptians certainly. <laughs> and then you even have personal gods. So you have household gods. Mm-hmm. You have superstition. You have, you know, witchcraft and and you know conjuring divination. Up, divination. All these kind of things that aren't even really gods, but they're kind of folk religion, superstition things. Mm-hmm. All in the scriptures. It's all there. But there's this overarching narrative that none of that is real. That that's all the stuff that we've tried to, to come up with to, des- to describe what's going on. But there actually is one God. Hmm. And that one God actually cares about people because they are the epitome of his work as creator. And, mm-hmm. and and then it gets weirder because it says the fact that those people do things that are contrary to that divine will is actually a problem. <laughs> yeah, that's not good. That's not good. And this, this divine being has some kind of quality about him, it, whatever, that doing what he doesn't desire has consequences. And the consequence, the word that we use to describe that consequence is death. Mm. Yeah. And it's something that you don't have to explain to anybody because we all know what it is. I just went to a funeral on Saturday. Mm-hmm. No one had to say, okay, now here's what death is. This person was alive and they just stopped being alive. And that's what we call death. 
No, we all know what it is because it happens all the time. We drive by cemeteries and, you know, yeah. your dad says, oh, <laughs> people are dying to get in there. You know, I mean, it just, it's, it's part of our parlance, right? Is it death is, death is part of life. Well, guess what? It isn't. Wait, death is not a part no, of life? No, it's not. Death <laughs> is the result of sin. Ah. Death is the punishment for sin. Death is what happens when people are created a certain way and we don't live that way. Mm. And, and the scriptures say it's death. This isn't death is, it's not supposed to be this way. It's not supposed to be this way. Yeah. And and so then you get this weird picture of this divine whatever it is actually cares about how I live, which is insane. <laughs> why would why would the divine whatever care? Doesn't they have more important things to do? Right. Like keep the stars afloat and, and you have a storehouse of snow at some point, you gotta get a shovel and kind of throw it on the <laughs> earth occasionally. There's you gotta make sure the waves don't go too far on the shore, all these things. Or you just the simply contemplate kinda, their own existence. Right. Or just sit around and be God or whatever that is. Right. But but the crazy thing about scripture is this divine cares. Which is really good news and really bad news. <laughs> so then I'm stuck because I'm I'm a person who, even on my best day, am not perfect according to this revelation of what this divine wants. Right. Right? And so I learned that, the, that this divine whatever it is wants certain things for me, and I'm not doing it. I can't do it. And what Scripture says is, this divine being is knowable. You can know his name. You can know his character. And he loves you so much that he has solved the problem you have with him. Mm -hmm. And that is Jesus. Well, there, there's a catch to the knowable part, though. He's not knowable in the sense that I can go and search him out and find him on my own. Right. See, now, now here's the issue. When I say, okay, he's knowable in Jesus, you say... <laughs> What does that mean? Yeah. How do I know him in Jesus? And we say, that's the point. Mm -hmm. This isn't by reason. This isn't by philosophy. This isn't by searching it out or by scientific experiment. This knowing is faith. And that faith is given to you as a gift by grace. Mm -hmm. And this faith is given to you not only in God, by God. So this divine being, we now can call him by name. In the Old Testament, he revealed himself to the patriarchs as Yahweh, right? Mm -hmm. And in the New Testament, he tells us his name is Jesus. And the amazing thing is that the New Testament writers equate Jesus with Yahweh. Right. And that's crazy <laughs> because when you're walking around in the New Testament, you go, okay, I, I got this God thing figured out. His name is Yahweh. He appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? He appeared to Moses on the mountain. I know who he is. Mm -hmm. And then Jesus walks around and he's like, okay, I'm going to say and do things that only Yahweh says and does. And they're like, who do you think you are? And he goes, well, uh, so when I was talking to Moses on the mountain, they're like, wait a minute, you uh, who? And he goes, yeah. So, um, you're searching the scriptures because you think in them you have life. And that's John 5. That's, yep. that's definitely a good idea. These are they that are written about me. Mm -hmm. And if you refuse to believe me as the object of the scriptures, you won't get life from the scriptures. Yeah. As a matter of fact, they will only accuse you. So this is what I said at the beginning where I said Jesus actually tells us. Right. So then all of a sudden, those places. this Jesus yeah. is actually saying this. Mm -hmm. And people say, who do you think you are? And he says, before Abraham was? I am. And they go, we're going to kill you They for pick up stones. Right. <laughs> and and what you find out is not just in the Gospel of John. Yeah. This is throughout the scriptures. When when Mark is, is relating the walking of Jesus on the water, he tells it in such a way that it sounds like he's describing Yahweh. Hmm. It sounds like the Yahweh of the Old Testament is now walking on water. And the disciples are like, I think it's a ghost. <laughs> Turns out, no, it's not a ghost. It's Jesus. And say, why is Mark describing Jesus like he would describe Yahweh? And that's the point. Mm -hmm. Is that Jesus is Yahweh in the flesh. The, the word who was God and was with God is enfleshed. And that is the person, Jesus. And notice I said person. He's actually a human. <laughs> And he's actually God. 
And this is the way the New Testament was pushing its hearers, its original hearers, to read the Old Testament. Yeah. Is that all of this is a giant prophecy about God in Christ working to save sinners. And the craziest thing about how he worked to save sinners is it's all about his death and resurrection. Like, oh, it's about miracles. It's about casting out demons. And he goes, we're going to see signs yeah, and wonders. That's really cool, but that's not it. Right. So so this is a famous thing in theology is that, is that people say the gospels are really passion narratives with a preface. That's all they are. Because mm. over a third of each gospel narrative is focused on the death and resurrection of Jesus. And most of that's on the death. Okay. So really, if you read New Testament theology, it's focused on the act of Jesus dying and rising as the vicarious atonement to pay for the sins of God's people. And it's crazy because what happens is you go back and you say, wait a minute, why would Jesus die? What, what, why? It's like, well, that's the substitutionary part because we just established that death is a result of sin. And you say, and now look back at the Old Testament. And, and what we learn through the entire Old Testament is that God forgives sins when blood is shed on behalf of those who sinned. Mm. Yep. And that's the entire sacrificial system. The difference being in the Old Testament, none right. of those sacrifices were good enough. Right. And so you realize that they have to that keep happening they again. Have to keep doing it. And again. Daily or yearly or every time you send. No. And you keep coming back and you keep making sacrifice. And the sacrifice had to be certain animals. And guess what? The Israelites stopped doing it. Well, we you and I had a conversation, I think a long time ago, about the number of animals it would have required oh, you, to actually do all the required sacrifices and the number of times you'd actually have to do them in order to meet and how it's literally unsustainable. But God set it up, Kevin. That can't right. be right. He told them to do something unsustainable. Yes. And this is what's so crazy <laughs> is when you read it and you, and you get this, you're like, oh, like the book of Hebrews actually says this. It was never about that. Yeah. Then we're not saying it wasn't true. We're not saying it didn't work. It did. God gave it, and it and it was a blessing to the people at the time. And that's it, they put their faith in the promises of God that when I slaughter this animal, right. God will forgive my sins. And they believe that promise, and God kept it. What was delivered was still what God promised. Yes, yeah. but the blood of the bull or the goat or the ram or whatever it was or the pigeon was not actually the blood that paid for your sin. That was a symbol. That was a prophecy of the blood that would actually pay for sin. And that's the blood of Christ. I, I had a thought just now, and maybe this is where we're going to go with this episode. This, When you brought up that this is unsustainable, it was never going to work. Mm -hmm. When we run into things like that in Scripture, mm -hmm. maybe that's our cue to say, Okay, maybe this is actually about Jesus in some way and the unsustainability of this thing or the confusion of this thing or this thing that doesn't make sense in and of itself. Well, that's because it's not the thing. It's actually pointing us towards Christ who completes it, who fulfills it, who actually accomplishes it. And this was never intended so, to be the fullness of the so thing. And that's why we get stop and get confused. Right. And we get confused. But let's let's go back. Okay. What's unsustainable about it? You can't too many animals. You don't have that enough time in the day. You'd be sacrificing all the time. Who 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 in this equation is unsustainable in that? Me? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> See, that's the point. I don't have the time or as the soon resources. As we start doing this, what we realize is is the unsustainability or the impossibility or the that does that's never going to work out. That's because it's pointing back at our role in this. Hmm. And it's like, yeah, that's exactly right. L read the book <laughs> of Hebrews. This is, it's all over the place. It's like, yeah, it's because you had an earthly priest. That's never going to work. Because mm -hmm. it's not only because he's sacrificing for your sins, he had to make a sacrifice for his own sins. His own sins. Yeah. This ain't ever going to work. You, you need a priest that has no sin to right. sacrifice for. You need a priest who is a human, but has no sins. And if you're listening and you have a favorite pastor, I'm glad you do. And he's probably awesome but he's not sinless, mm. right? 
And you can go back to all the priests of the Old Testament, all the prophets of the Old Testament, and you say, yeah, they were awesome. They were great men of God. We revered them. We thank God for them. And, and we look at them as examples in the faith. But they weren't perfect. Yeah. They weren't sinless. We're still waiting for that sinless one to come. And then all of a sudden, behold, the virgin is with child and gives birth to a son. And you will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And, and they're going, wait, is that a metaphor? I'm like, no, 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 no. That's all literal. <laughs> it's literally a virgin. God is actually with and us. it's literally God yeah. with us. And they're like, whoa, I thought that was all metaphorical. It's like, no, 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 that was literal. That's actually happening. <laughs> and that's what exactly happens is Jesus grows up and he's actually God with us. And so going back to the equation. So what happens is we're all philosophically kind of going, well, okay, I think there's this big divine thing up there somewhere, whatever is controlling things. And how does that relate to me? I don't know. And, and Jesus is actually the answer. When you read the end of John chapter one, Jesus is hanging out with his first disciples and Nathaniel comes walking up and he's like, here is a true, there's light, there's, there's, there's a sea. No God. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what good can come out of Nazareth? All that whole kind of stuff. And then um, he says to Nathaniel, so like, I saw you under the fig tree before, you know. And he's yeah. like, whoa, that's amazing. Goes, no before, before Andrew called you? That's no big or deal. Philip. Philip. Philip, yeah. That's no big deal. I, I, you're going to see greater things than these. It's like, okay, you are like the king of Israel, the son of God. And Jesus says, well, yeah, you're going to see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. What? <laughs> and what he's saying is, I am what links you to God. Mm. I am the only link between humans and God. Now, that's that's the point of Christology. Last week we talked about Whedon's podcast, and he actually covers that when yes. he gets to that portion of his podcast, that Jacob's ladder and Jacob being a rung on that ladder right. of Jesus. Exactly. Jesus is actually the point. Jesus is the, the thing that links heaven and earth. Yeah. And and now just think that through. Read the entire Bible with Jesus being the link between heaven and earth. Whenever God and man interact, that's Christ mediating. That's Christ sacrifice. That's Christ revelation. It's that's the role of Jesus. So here's here's the goal of all of this is that when you think about God. You're always running to Jesus. Yeah. So when I pray, we'll ask anything in... In Jesus' name. Right. Yeah. See, it's not just I'm coming to God as me and kind of like, okay, divine essence up there thing, whatever. <laughs> no, no, no. I hope you like me today. Yeah, I sure hope you're on my side. I'm sure hope you're listening. Right. And is anyone up there? No, 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 no. We come to God and we say, our Father. Mm -hmm. Why? Because I know his Son. Yeah. And so we pray in Jesus' name. Why? Because I am saying God relates to me. How? In Christ. And because I'm not I've, going around that. And because I'm going right I've through been, it. And I've been made an heir with Christ. Well, okay, now you just therefore, skipped ahead. Now but, you just skipped ahead. But therefore, so I'm on the, that's, that's how I get the, the Father world, part. <laughs> how in the world did you become okay with God? Just because Jesus did something doesn't mean you're okay with God. See, and that's what we call the gospel. Mm, yeah. First aspect is that God in Christ has accomplished the salvation of the world. It's done. It's a done deal. Jesus isn't partially done. It's done. Death and resurrection of Christ, done deal. It is finished, right? Mm -hmm. John 19, Tetelestai. It's finished. That doesn't do you any good. It, still it, has, to be it has to get to me to somehow. you. Yeah. And the good news is God gives it to you freely. You don't have to earn it. You know, say, oh, Jesus did that. Now, how do I, what do I do? <laughs> well, you got to run five miles a day. You got to, you know, you got to have a beer. Make sure you eat according to the Daniel plan. You got to eat according to Daniel plan. Yes. You've got to kiss your daughters on the top of the head when you get home tonight and treat them properly. I, I've i been doing it on the nose. We'll see you're wrong. You're uh, right. See, and that's the point is you come with a list of things. Say, well, okay, to get what Jesus earned, I've got to. And you're like back to, okay, now we're back to the unsustainable model. Yeah. <laughs> because whenever I have to, I know me well enough to know that at some point I'm going to fail to do that. Mm -hmm. So now I'm back to wondering if what Jesus did counts for me. Right. Does it count for this sinner? I can see it counting for you, but I can't see it counting for this sinner. Because if you knew... If I'm truly honest with who I am. If yeah. I, I know my thoughts. Yeah. I know my sins that I tr have trouble repenting of. I know the sins that I've repented of every Sunday and gone back to again. Mm -hmm. There's no way God can love this sinner. No, it ain't going to happen. 
and the gospel is is that not only did Christ accomplish salvation for you, but he also gives it to you freely. And that's when Lutherans talk about means of grace, mm-hmm. right? Means. What is the means by which God gives it exactly. to us? What's the instrument through which what Christ accomplished on the cross becomes yours? Yeah. And and it's very clear in the scriptures that, and, and all the Lutherans just chill out for a second. <laughs> it's very clear in scripture that there is one means of grace. Oh, yep. Triggered. Yeah. <laughs> and that one on. means of grace is the word. Yeah. And, and I, you can argue with God about this if you want, but it's the word. <laughs> it's the way he created the world. It's the way he sustains the world. It's, it's the revelation of his son. It's the word. Now, how does that word come to us? Word well, a couple different and ways. Sacraments, sacraments, right? So we hear it in the preached word, the read word, the proclaimed word, the all the kinds of the absolution, all that. But you also find that word active in baptism. It's mm-hmm. not just plain water, right? Yeah. See, it's not just this Luther's explicit on this. It's not the water that's doing it. It's the word. Or Titus 3 5. It's the right. washing it's of the washing regeneration. Of re- John 3. You, you can't say the kingdom of God without water and the spirit. It's mm-hmm. it's it's the spirit brings the word into the water and it empowers the water to do this miraculous thing, which is what? To forgive sins, to give the Holy Spirit, to to bring a person that is in sin to bring them into Christ. Romans to, 6. To bury you in right. his resurrection. To his join death. you to his death. Yeah. What an amazing thing. Okay, his death and resurrection accomplishes salvation. Now baptism joins you to that death and resurrection. So guess what you get? The death and the resurrection. You get salvation. Out of the, this is great. Yep. What did I do? Uh, really nothing. You got <laughs> water and the word on you. It's like, uh, Okay. Well, I didn't do much. Like, good. Then you didn't mess much up. <laughs> yeah, <you know>? yeah. <laughs> okay, and then you go, well... If you didn't do it, you also can't mess it up. Yeah, so you're like, what else I got? You're like, well, we got this meal that Jesus gave us, right? When he said, take, eat. This is my body. Mm-hmm. And we went, what is that, a metaphor? <laughs> what do you mean he is? Like, kind of sounds like a metaphor. Or, you know, yeah. like, like, you said a bunch of weird stuff. Is this a metaphor? And then he said, this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. You're like, whoa, so this metaphor forgives sins. That's weird. Mm-hmm. And then you read, you keep reading. You're like, no, 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 no. This is literal. For, for whenever you eat this bread, it's a participation in the body of Christ. Whenever you drink this cup, it's participation in the blood of Christ. And if you eat and drink this body, this bread and wine in an unworthy manner, you're guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Ooh, now you've moved to Paul. And, yeah, and now you're yeah. into Paul, or against the body of the Lord. First Corinthians. And now yeah. you're actually in Paul saying, what Jesus gave to me, I give on to you. And it's not metaphor. Right. Paul, it wasn't Paul, metaphor when, God, when Jesus gave it. Right. And it's not metaphor now. And Paul's really the one that teaches us that it isn't metaphor. Right. I mean, and so we go back and read the, the words of institution in the gospel. We go, okay, so he meant it when he said it. That's cool. Yeah. But but <laughs> it really helps us to read the entire New Testament on this and to see that this meal is not just you know some kind of celebratory feast of, let's remember what Jesus did. It is that, mm-hmm. but it actually does something. Yeah. It actually forgives sins. And if you take it, Without faith, it actually hurts you, which means this ain't no just remembrance <laughs> meal and you're remembering wrong or something. You have faulty memory. No, this, right? Jesus is actually present in bread and wine, in body and blood to forgive sins. Okay. Well, guess what? But we can't stop. We, we were talking about the word. Yep. Well, guess what makes this bread and this wine the body and blood of Christ? It's the word. The word. It's the word. Christ's words joined with it. Right. And so he says it, we believe it. And and so what we have is how do you get this Jesus accomplishment? His death and resurrection for the forgiveness of sins, his perfect life as, you know, vicarious living in righteousness, his his perfect everything, his ascension. How does all that count for you? He gives it to you freely mm-hmm. in the word, in the sacraments. And it's just gift. And you say, well, that's great. Now what I do? And you say, now go live. Go live as a child of God. Go live. It's really simple. There's only two commandments. Love, love the Lord God. your God with everything you got. Mm-hmm. And love your neighbor as yourself. You're yeah. like, cool. That's all I got to do? <laughs> like, yeah. It's like, well, okay, I really messed up the first one. It's like, yeah, you did. 
let's go back to what the word teaches you, who accomplishes your salvation. See, even after you're saved, it's not your ability to stay saved that saves you. It's still the death and the resurrection of Christ that counts as your salvation. Mm-hmm. And so what do we do is we fill our lives with this word. We read it all the time because it's always, it's always giving Christ to us. Always. Whenever you open the Bible, it's going to give Christ to you. Now, it might come to you in law. He might come to you and say, yeah. dude, you are <laughs> messing up. Yep. And you say, yeah, I am. That's right. And so what do I do with that? Is I go to the place where there's a solution for my, for my deathly sin. Mm-hmm. There's only one solution. His name is Jesus. So I run to Jesus and I say, Jesus, I have done something that I can't overcome. I've messed up again. I've sinned against you. I've sinned against God the Father. I've sinned against the Holy Spirit. Te- technically, all the things I've done, I can't overcome. Right. And I realize, <laughs> wait a minute, there's, there's nothing I can overcome. So I pretty much just need you. Yeah. And he always says, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Also, I know this about you. This this isn't a surprise. Right. He's not going, <laughs> you did what? <laughs> Where did that come from? I did not see that, yeah, coming. I didn't see that coming. So nope. So again, this is why... Christology and a Christological focus of Scripture is so important because it reminds us that when we approach God, whether it's in repentance or whether it's in rejoicing, we approach Him in Christ because that is the way that He shows us who He is, what He has done for us, and all of His promises. Mm -hmm. All the promises of God, no matter what they are, they're all kept in Christ. And so the almond is spoken to the glory of God, which means I learn to live my life in Christ. I learn to love my neighbor in Christ. I learn to serve in my vocation in Christ. Why? Because that's how I'm taught to live. The, the entire universe is contingent on Christ. Mm-hmm. Right? Yep. It's all for him. It's all about him. And he sustains it all. So what happens to us? We're like, well, we're going to be in Christ. So now if I approach God's very word to me, how am I going to approach that? I'm going to read the entire thing through Christ. Christ. This this is something that I will say because of what we've been doing with Crucial, I've benefited from this personally. Um, lately, my, my family, when we're doing our either morning prayer or evening prayer, we've kind of been switching back and forth. We're going through the book of Judges. I don't know. Have I mentioned this on the podcast? I think so. Maybe a little bit. It's okay. It's still true. Um, but but what's amazing, the book of Judges is one of those books where people are like, oh, that's the mean God. Yeah. That's scary God of the Old Testament. angry. He wants to kill everybody, including his own people. Right. Like He's just mad at he's everybody, mad. and everybody needs to die. But when you approach the book of Judges in this way, and you look at how how is this about Christ, and the we didn't have this conversation before I started right. talking to my kids and going through judges. It was just like, let's pick it up. And I'm sitting here thinking, how is this actually about Christ? And mm-hmm. intentionally reading that book that way, all of a sudden it just completely opens up. And this, yeah. this might end up being our judges in five. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> kind of, you guys are getting a little bit of preview of what we'll be doing with the judges, but it's amazing because you look at here's judges God's people, his chosen people that he's redeemed, brought up out of Egypt, they're now finally in the promised land, and he told them, look, kill sin. Right. You need to kill it. it. Don't live with it. Don't let it into your house. Just kill all of it. Get rid of it. Sin, in this case, was the the people. Mm -hmm. The people there were so evil Mm -hmm. that he knew if you live with them, that that sin will infect you. That evil is coming in, so just kill it. Yep. Well, they they didn't. Yeah. Yeah. They... We, we tend to like to live with our sin, don't right. we? It's like, yeah. oh, I'll be okay. I'll just or have a little bit God of it. God can't really mean kill. Right. <laughs> and so the book of Judges is then this constant cycle of they've lived with sin, it's come in, and oh, look, now they're worshiping the other gods. And you know that worship involves some pretty nasty right. things. Very. Sexual stuff, sacrifices, human, human sacrifice and stuff. Sometimes. It's like... This it's the it's bad it's, it's nasty and good. the Israelites are like this is great we love it and you have these statements of and they were giving their sons in marriage to their mm-hmm. daughters and their daughters in marriage to their sons it's like mm-hmm. they are fully integrating this mm-hmm. is bad and you 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 think well okay I guess God's just gonna wipe them out but he doesn't right he sends a judge mm-hmm. or as I've te- as I'm teaching my kids replace the word judge with savior. Yeah. And see what happens. Mm -hmm. In the book of Judges, Mm -hmm. because there's always a Savior. God always sends Mm -hmm. a Savior. In the book of Judges, the the Savior is the judge. Mm -hmm. 
And here's the judge. And what does the judge do? He saves them from their sin. He right. frees them from it. He kills the ones that are supposed to have been killed, who uh-huh. didn't get fully killed before, kills sin, saves them, draws them out, and now they are living with God again. They are in faith, and they are God's people. They're brought into that. But the judge is only human, uh-huh. and the saving work that that judge does doesn't last. And and the Israelites right. sin again. They sin again. And they're like, wait, hold on. We really do kind of like these people, and they start going out again and it's just the cycle over and over but it's a cycle that god doesn't leave them in he continues to send that judge and each one's a little bit different and you see the flaws of these judges as you kind of go through like it's okay gideon were you even a christian like you're constantly questioning and whining and what is going on here and this jephthah we're about to read him next and this whole thing with his daughter it's like weird wait wait you were the spirit of God came upon you. Yeah. So whenever that happens, you're going to be victorious and you go and make this vow. Yeah. What Crazy, you, isn't it? Which is weird. But if I'm looking at it, this is through reading it through Christ and I recognize, Oh, this isn't God telling him to make the vow and then God holding him to it. This is someone who did not trust God's right. promises and wanted to add to it through his own works. It's like so. Whoa. Okay. So okay. The, but you and I don't know if you've read the the end of the story, but it gets worse oh, because yeah. the whole point the, of the book the, of Judges, the, li- the end of that book, is one of the worst lines that. in all of Scripture. Right. But it's depressing. Like, but awful. the point the point of the book of Judges is they're doing all this because they don't have a king. Mm-hmm. And so what happens? Well, they get is a king in the middle. The there. last judge. Yeah. The last judge is Samuel. Mm-hmm. And he becomes the first, prophet the first prophet of the monarchy. And what happens is the people come to Samuel like, we want a king because they want to be like all the other nations. He's like, I don't believe you keep saying this. You don't want to be like the other <laughs> You nations. don't know what you're saying, The unique people. thing about you is that God is your king. Yeah. And you can't get a better king. And they're also, like, God was their judge, right? And they their wanted savior. other judges. Right. And, and, and so, well, look, we're still is, in that cycle again. In First Samuel, it literally is a narrative of them getting a king. Mm-hmm. And this is the thing: is is that say you know the whole I want a king? No, you don't. You're just gonna do no, no, no. Okay, we'll give him a king. So what happens? And this is what I'm bringing up: is that Saul, the first king, is told to go to the Amalekites and kill all of them, mm. man, woman, child. Ox, donkey, weather vane, I don't care what it yep. is, kill it. Yep. Well, guess what he does? Does he bring back the cattle? He brings back, you know, the choices of everything. He's like, yeah. oh, I brought these back as a sacrifice. Right. So God has to be okay with it. And Samuel's <laughs> like, you just disobeyed God. That was pretty clear. What part and of everything did now you not understand? You are out. You're no longer king. Yeah. I'm going to anoint someone else to be king. Your line will not continue. Right. And yep. I'm going to find someone who's actually after God's own heart. And even that, see, we see a prophecy of who is our king. Mm-hmm. And and what you read is the New Testament. All of a sudden you have people crying out to Jesus as the son of David. All yeah. of a sudden you have Jesus doing things as a king. You have people asking Jesus to judge them. Right. And you have Jesus... Asking people to... S- is say, this weird? You want them to him to save them. Yeah, and you, him you have in Genesis when that video comes out, or when we do the Bible in five. There, you have God's righteous one that we talk mm-hmm. about. His this righteous one, his chosen one, and you'll see the flaws in them. But Christ is the righteous one. He's right. actually all the fulfillment of all of that, and actually does it. Perfectly. So then, in First Samuel, you say, "Okay, good, we got rid of Saul. Now we're going to David because he's awesome, right? And he's the best. He's a man of God's own heart. He never <laughs> sins." And obviously, well, that doesn't last so long. Oops. <laughs> but but then even David, who is the Lord's anointed, that's the word Christ, right? He mm-hmm. is the Lord's Christ. He's the Lord's Messiah. Yeah. But he has sin, mm-hmm. and so we're still waiting. Yeah, we're still waiting. Where's the king that has no sin? Where's the judge that has no sin? Where's the Messiah that has no sin? And all of a sudden, Jesus shows up, and he's Messiah, Mm -hmm. and he's king, and he's prophet, and he's judge, and he's savior, and he's the son of God. And what happens is you say, oh, this entire narrative of Israel's history was a prophecy leading us to Christ. Mm -hmm. And now that we have Christ, we go back and reread that entire narrative pointing to him. 
So and, we, and we can actually say all of Scripture is about Christ. It's all about Christ. And this, this is what we mean. And, and, Look, and then all of a sudden we're like, well, is, are we in good company saying this? Is it, well, Luke 24, Jesus says it explicitly. Mm-hmm. That Moses, prophets, the Psalms, the entire Old Testament, it's, it's all, all about me. It's all, yep, that's all me. It's all about the Christ dying and rising. Yeah. That's what it is. And so that's what we're getting at is, is we are encouraging ourselves, our families, mm-hmm. everyone we know, um, to read scripture about Christ, but also to understand that Jesus is the way that we relate to God and that God relates to us. Mm-hmm. We don't look for God outside of Christ and we don't try to live our lives outside of Christ. We yeah. believe that he is God's definitive action to save us. And that living in Christ is blessedness. Yeah. And that is the crucial conversation as well. So hopefully you guys stick around with us. If you're new, just joining us, this is what we're doing. And if you want to do that along with us, subscribe, YouTube, podcast, all that wonderful stuff. And we'll see you guys next time. See ya.